Before we get on to our excellent guests, I want to bring in uh, the godfather of the uh, Australian Liberty move, uh, Movement, of course, the great Tim Andrews, with whom I've had many, many late night discussions over Facebook Messenger uh, in deep frustration about this very topic. Uh, Tim, uh, wh what do you think about uh, the so-called national conservative movement and how we as libertarians respond to them? Look, I think that this is probably the most important and most interesting session in this entire conference, because this gets to the very, very core of what the political debate right now is. But I would argue that this isn't necessarily a debate about the economics of the issue or the cultural wars of the issue. This is a conversation that we now need to have where libertarians and pro-market people need to realise what we've done wrong, what we have done as a movement, as people who believe in personal responsibility, that has led to a situation where so many conservatives now think that the market isn't the solution to their problems. Previously, conservatives and libertarians used to agree that we had this fusion of small government, but traditional institutions, and that's fracturing. In order for us to fight the left effectively, I think that we need to start rebuilding that alliance. And this is why we specifically framed this panel, not as a debate between, you know, who's right, who's wrong, libertarians, national conservatives, but rather why and how libertarians and people who believe in the free markets should actually respond to this rising phenomenon of populism, of national conservatism, and of people who claim to be conservatives and still would would disagree with fundamental concepts of the free market, argue for you know, industrial policy, closed borders, those sorts of things. And I think this is going to, we have three phenomenal panelists who have really got to the heart of this issue. And I think that when this session gets recorded and people are gonna be sharing the, this and so on, this is going to be the one that will go viral because I am so impressed with the caliber of our panelists and this is such an important issue. It is an extremely important issue and one, as I said, that I care very, very much about. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first uh, cab off the rank for this panel. And uh, that is of course, Ian Murray. Ian, uh, good, to, uh, good to have you with us. It, it's a delight to be back at the Friedman Conference, even if I can't actually be with you in person. Uh, Friedman Conference was, uh, I think, the best conference uh, I've ever attended, and I'm delighted uh, to, to, to be back with you. Uh, I, I thought I'd start by you know, trying to get to the, the root of, uh, of what's going on here. I think for, for at least the last 50 years, uh, the primary issue around which political identity aligned was economic. Are you in favor of the state controlling economic decisions or the individual? And I think this was true across the developed world. And that's the distinction which most people termed left and right. Uh, there were other issues as well, however. In most of the developed world, the issue was social, traditional beliefs as opposed to permissive beliefs. Put these two issues together and you have uh, the political model that most libertarians have understood for the last uh, 40, 50 years. The two alignments become axes in a sort of two by two model, you know, four quadrants. Most conservatives were economic right and socially conservative. Most so-called liberals, as we use the expression here in the United States, were economic left and socially permissive. Libertarians, by and large, were economic right and socially permissive, but they allied with conservatives because economics was the primary issue. Similarly, the old school of economic left and socially conservative allied with the liberals. These were the old blue dog Democrats that you may have heard about. The trouble is that that model is now history. What we have seen over the past decade is a political realignment around the question of identity, national identity versus cosmopolitanism. Are you a citizen of your native land or a citizen of the world? Are you a nationalist or a transnationalist? That's a binary choice, and its sudden importance has upended our politics. Many here in the States think this is a purely American phenomenon. It's not. Look at Europe. Over a decade ago, a party called the True Finns 
came from nowhere to be a political force in Finland. In Eastern Europe, avowedly nationalist parties arose in every country. And look at France. The national rally has gone from a fringe extremist party to one at level pegging with Macron's cosmopolitan liberal party. Indeed, one can look at Brexit as a symptom of this realignment. When I left the UK over 20 years ago, my Euroscepticism was very much a minority position. The realignment over there, however, made Brexit possible. But the question of social attitudes has not gone away either. This means that economics may not even be the secondary consideration anymore. Again, look at the UK. The party of Margaret Thatcher, the Conservative Party, is advocating, advocating post-coronavirus policies that they proudly describe as Rooseveltian. And that's FDR, not Theodore. So the political world has changed. In America, political realignments happen within the two-party system. Now, as I've said, libertarians, especially here in America, have tended to side with conservatives. So the GOP has for decades been a party of economic freedom and social conservatism. Many libertarians, to be sure, felt uncomfortable with the social conservatism, but they put up with it because their primary issue was the economy. I'll add here that there is a great deal of thoughtful writing about how these two issues are not necessarily at odds and might even be complementary. Frank Meyer, the fusionist philosophy, uh, for example, felt that liberty and tradition needed one another. Now, it may be partly because the marriage of these two philosophies was so successful that the political realignment has caught economic liberals flat-footed. We have been surprised at how quickly many conservatives have turned against free market orthodoxy. Now, a lot of people here and abroad are likely to place the blame on Donald Trump, who is certainly a polarizing figure who has upended a lot of what we thought were settled questions. However, just as Brexit was a symptom and not a cause of the political realignment there, it's my opinion that Donald Trump is, sim is, is similarly a symptom and not a cause. For instance, we knew that Trump was a protectionist. However, the speed with which protectionism has become received wisdom in the GOP has surprised many of us. Similarly, the speed at which old discredited policies, such as industrial policy, have returned is striking. This is especially surprising because at its heart, free market economics is empirical. We know these policies don't work because we've put decades of effort into analyzing them. It was, for instance, Lewis Powell's recommendation that when the free enterprise system was under attack in the early 1970s, that American business should support the creation of academic in uh, institutions to challenge collectivist thought. And that led to the creation of the Heritage Foundation. Yet it seems all of that work, the mountains of policy studies and analyses, has come to naught, and it's been conservatives who have rejected it. I'll say here that this doesn't apply in all policy areas. I work primarily on regulatory issues, and there is still a general uh, agreement among conservatives that the economy is overregulated. Yet there is an appetite for regulation in conservatives in many areas. Antitrust, for instance, is no longer the realm of the hipsters. Onerous regulation of tech companies is another conservative favorite. Conservatives pull down the fairness doctrine for broadcast media, but many want to see one imposed on the internet. And a quick word about energy policy. At the moment, one of the few areas where conservatives and economic liberals remain in lockstep is on energy policy. However, if we look at what has happened in Europe, we can see that green energy policies and nationalism have become quite closely aligned. Boris Johnson's government has announced a phase out of all gas powered cars. Carbon tariffs are being seriously proposed by nationalist parties all over the continent. It may yet happen here. I want to raise one final point before I actually bother to address the question before us, which is that something similar is happening on the left. People who are nationalist, but whose economic policies were collectivist, are deserting the left in droves. In some countries, the left parties have responded by embracing nationalism. Look at the Danish Social Democrats, for instance, or the Scottish, the Scottish National Party, which used to be called the Tartan Tories, but have now completely destroyed and replaced the Labour Party as a party of economic collectivism. However, in other places, and I think America is one of them, a radical cosmopolitanism has taken over the left that actively rejects any association with the nation at all. 
I think that the current moment in America is this movement flexing its muscles. The 1619 Project, the use of justified revulsion at the Confederacy as a Trojan horse to attack the Founding Fathers. And the attack on such fundamental value as free speech that we heard about in the last session are all part of this. This has sadly helped fuel the revival of socialism on the left. We should remember that Rosa Luxemburg was of the opinion that rights were not rights unless they reject a power disadvantage. I talk about this in my new book, The Socialist Temptation, uh, which is available July 28th from all good booksellers. But this is exactly what is happening with the assault on free speech. Unless your speech actively challenges systemic racism, the argument goes, you have no right to say it. What does redress the ills done by systemic racism? Socialism, they say. Thus, all the policy proposals we see advance from the left to combat the problems they think need to be addressed. And to be sure, many of them need to be addressed, as Steve Horvitz will argue passionately, I am sure, in the next session. They are all based around increased power over the economy and individual businesses for the government or for labor unions privileged by government. This is why I think that the hope of some libertarians that the left will adopt more market-friendly policies is misplaced. While that does look to be happening in the UK, where Keir Starmer is uh, decorbinifying the Labour Party slowly, and in France, where it is now clear that the ex-socialist Macron is probably the only hope left for markets, the reverse seems to be happening in the US, where previously moderate Democrats are signing on to increasingly radical and comprehensive policy packages. They are all protectionist, redistributivist, and burdensome to great degree. The Green New Deal, for instance, is now official Democrat policy. Economic liberals for sure, and I would suggest most libertarians, should run like the wind from it. Now, many libertarians might rightly be sympathetic to the stated goals of increased racial justice and the like, but they should remember the words of the British journalist Toby Young. Socialist or, socialism always begins with the lofty sounding goals about the international brotherhood of man and always ends with having to eat your own pets. So if aligning with the left to promote free markets seems unpromising, to put it mildly, how should economic liberals react? I'll say here that if immigration is your primary economic issue, then you are probably going to have to go with the left on a Fiat Justitia Ruat Kaili basis. I understand that, and I wish you and your pets good luck. I say this as an immigrant and as someone who would vastly expand immigration to allow for many more metics like myself. But for the rest of us, I think the issue is one of communication. We have forgotten how to speak to conservatives, to relay the message that economic liberalism is actually good for conservative values. Part of this is because we've taken the fusionist alliance for granted. Part of it is because in the 1990s, when even socialist parties were embracing markets in the way Tony Blair's Labour and Bill Clinton's Democrats did, libertarians saw a chance to reach out to the left. We learned to speak the language of social justice, even as we forgot the language of tradition. So we could make the argument that free trade was good because it would raise millions, even billions out of poverty. We could make the argument that welfare was hurting the poor. We learned how to couch economic arguments in the language of equality and fairness. And we had a great deal of success. A lot of our ideas on criminal justice reform, immigration and other areas were actually adopted by the left. This was and is a good thing. Yet we forgot the language of tradition and community. In this respect, our concentration on empirics hurt us. A factory closed and we would say that the closure of the factory was a small concentrated cost compared with the huge distributed benefits of trade. Tom Palmer talked about this problem in his uh, introductory remarks. And I fear that we heard more examples of that from uh, Joe Jurgensen earlier today. What we were not saying was that innovation and change were time-honored American traditions that the American character was well suited to respond to. That unemployment and the social disruption caused by it were exacerbated by regulation and taxation. That government had helped to sweep away mutual aid societies and the associations that built resilience and that Tocqueville thought were uniquely American. That blaming central government for local problems in adjustment was contrary to the principles of American federalism. Would these arguments have worked? I don't know, but I can't remember any of us making them. Instead, sticking with the, uh, the trade question, we have allowed a strange alliance of protectionists and labor unions to define the terms of the debate. Libertarians have to rise to that challenge. I recommend, by the way, uh, a new paper from Scott Linkercombe of the Cato Institute that analyzes the evidences for the, full, for the ill effects of the so-called China shock 
It is all about how the debate does not reflect the evidence. Communicating so that it does is our challenge. There is maybe a more fundamental question. Many of the leaders of nationalist conservatism appear to think that liberty is quite simply of no use to conservatives. Jonah Goldberg pointed out in his column this morning the hostility of people like Patrick Deneen and Sir Abamari to the liberty of the founders. I don't think most American conservatives agree with that, though. Liberty is important to them, at least partly because it's their tradition. Here in Virginia, you can have the Gadsden flag, you know, the yellow don't tread on me or no step on snack uh, flag on your car's license plate. There are half a dozen of those in my cul-de-sac alone, and only a couple of them are mine. That's why I suspect that as long as we continue to reach individuals through our outreach, through the traditional media, digital media, and social media, and as long as we get, uh, we, as long as we speak in the right language, I think we can still get our message heard. So my bottom line is that I think nationalists and economic liberals can reach a form of rapprochement that will help to head off the threat of radical cosmopolitan socialism. Otherwise, I fear that we in America at least will be engulfed in what DCPR consultant Bruce Mailman calls the woke apocalypse, a massive restructuring of government around the principles of radical identity politics and enviro-socialist redistribution and control of private industry that will make the New Deal look like a golden age of free enterprise. If that threat cannot bring us together, we are lost. And that is something that liberals and conservatives should view with dismay. Well, thank you so much, Ian. And that's a, a very sobering but accurate uh, sort of assessment of where we're at. And I, I think in particular your, your, your uh, uh, assertion that libertarians and economic liberals in particular have lost the language of community and uh, society. And I, and I think that goes all the way back to the old, there's no such thing as a society, only an economy and all sorts of other things like that. Uh, the language of tradition and community has been used to bludgeon libertarians. I can't say the number of you know, right-wing gatherings I've been to where people started mouthing off about libertarians before they have you know, worked out who I was and where I stand uh, because it's become conflated with this very woke self-expression at all costs, the individual at all costs. That is a, a complete bastardization and perversion, I think, of our message. Uh, but enough from me. I'll hand it over now to, uh, to Dan McCarthy for your thoughts. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm very honoured to be addressing the conference today, especially since I know for our Australian friends, it's uh, almost 4.30am uh, in the morning. So um, you're obviously very dedicated to liberty indeed, if you are uh, tuning in. Freedom never sleeps. Uh, you know, uh, I'll start perhaps with uh, a few notes of optimism, and then maybe get a little more pessimistic uh, as I go on. But uh, it's worth noting that this, this populist moment, um, which has produced national conservatism, uh, actually has some of its roots in libertarianism. Uh, so, for example, I think you could see uh, antecedents to the Donald Trump phenomenon with uh, the very successful insurgency that uh, Ron Paul ran within the Republican Party in 2008 and 2012. It was not so successful as to actually get the Republican Party's nomination, but it clearly showed that there was a vein of populism, a rejection of the political establishment uh, that was waiting to be tapped by a candidate who had uh, you know, sort of um, a better window of opportunity than Ron Paul had in those years. And that's something that I think uh, you saw Donald Trump take advantage of in 2016. Similarly, the Tea Party movement, it certainly had a libertarian emphasis uh, in terms of, uh, you know, rejecting the bailouts that occurred uh, at the end of the George W. Bush years and under Barack Obama. Uh, but the uh, Tea Party movement was also a populist movement. So uh, conservatives and uh, libertarians came together in a form of populism uh, in the United States, which I think set the groundwork for what happened in 2016 with its rejection, not only of Hillary Clinton, but also of uh, Jeb Bush. It was a rejection of both parties' establishments. It was really rebellion by the so-called deplorables, by the people who had been overlooked by the political elites in both parties, who said that they were basically mad as hell and they're not going to take it anymore. And uh, this has been true uh, in other parts of the English-speaking world as well. So the success of Brexit was very clearly a matter of uh, what had been uh, a free market critique of um, the European Union coming from uh, many of the original opponents of uh, the EU uh, had combined with a populist rejection of the kind of foreign bureaucracy and control uh, that Brussels represented. And so I think also with Brexit, you have a combination of libertarian and uh, sort of national conservative interests uh, coming together using the medium of populism to succeed politically. 
Now, the question is, does this kind of uh, past record indicate that there's going to be a future for a combined uh, uh, populist, libertarian, and uh, national conservative uh, project? And I suspect here in the United States, you're actually going to see some degree of uh, healing of the wounds uh, after the November elections. Uh, now, partly that is, if uh, Joe Biden winds up uh, winning and becoming the next president, I think you're very quickly going to see that conservatives and libertarians will come together in opposing the radically woke, the radically socialist agenda that Joe Biden and his party will be pursuing. Biden himself, you know, has this kind of mixed record. He was, you know, a supporter of crime bills. He was a very unwoke kind of politician for most of his career. But of course, as we've seen during the Trump years, a president is not necessarily the person who is able to uh, give all the policy direction to his administration. But in fact, there is a deep state, there is a, uh, a policy apparatus within each of the parties, an elite policy apparatus that will um, fill the positions where policies are actually made, regardless of who the president is. And so we've seen Donald Trump undermined by his own staff in many cases, uh, certainly with someone like uh, John Bolton on foreign policy, it was spectacularly so. And similarly, if uh, Joe Biden gets into office, I don't think we can expect Joe Biden's uh, sort of record from the 1990s uh, to be restraining his uh, sort of woke tendencies or indeed the sort of uh, um, ascendant uh, Bernie Sanders social democratic tendencies within the Democratic Party. Really, the party rather than the candidate, I think, is going to be dominant uh, should Bernie Sanders win. Uh, so, sorry, <laughs> should Joe Biden win. It will be, in, in fact, kind of a, a shadow victory for Bernie Sanders. Now, if Donald Trump wins re-election, even there, I think you're going to find that uh, there may be uh, a little bit more of a meeting of minds taking place uh, between libertarians and national conservatives over time, in part as a sort of second term policy agenda has to be formulated. And of course, if we look at Donald Trump's first uh, term, we actually find a number of things that libertarians should be very, very happy with indeed, starting with uh, the tax cut, for example, which was uh, good for business, it was good for the wealthy, but it was good for everyone. It was good for workers, it was good for families. Uh, Ian has already alluded to the success the Trump administration has had in restraining and in some cases rolling back uh, administrative burdens. And I think a very important uh, point of common ground is in foreign policy, where both libertarians and national conservatives would like to see the United States adopt a more national interest focused foreign policy, a more realistic foreign policy, and a more restrained foreign policy relative to what either the humanitarian interventionist left or the neocon imperialist right would like to pursue. So one of the reasons why Donald Trump is so strongly disliked by everyone from John Bolton through to the Washington Post is precisely because he is not involving us in the kinds of nation building wars that uh, Tulsi Gabbard uh, quite effectively attacked during the Democratic primaries in the, the past uh, uh, several months. And that um, you know, Americans of all political stripes have come to be very skeptical of, yet nevertheless, the elite within both parties uh, still has this favorable interventionist view on foreign policy. Whereas Donald Trump has successfully not only articulated, I think, a national conservative tendency to stay out of conflicts, you know, from Syria to Libya or wherever the case may be, but it's a, a tendency that libertarians can agree with. It's a tendency that realists and the restrainers uh, on the right and the left should agree with as well. So there are these points of common ground. I also think there is a fundamental philosophical point of common ground as well, or at least perhaps it's a, a common ground that emerges out of an emotional matrix, if not a articulate philosophy, but it's something that tends to get overlooked. Um, and that is, in many respects, the national conservatism and the populism we see on the Anglo-American right at the moment is a kind of emotionally libertarian movement. It really is a movement by people who feel as if they have been pressed down by their employers in some cases, by uh, government officials and bureaucrats in other cases, and by basically uh, you know, the Communist Party in China in, in yet another case. Uh, but there are people who feel as if their freedoms as Americans have been greatly constrained by a world in which America's own political elite uh, is strongly opposed to the interests uh, and the rights and the freedoms and liberties of deplorables, whether that's in a matter of uh, free speech uh, in you know, social media. Uh, they also think that there is a uh, tendency for um, our financial system and for our political leaders to prefer the efficiencies of a close relationship with the People's Republic of China to actually looking out for the economic well-being, the you know, sort of job security of uh, middle Americans. And libertarians tend not to think of that as being a freedom issue, quite the opposite. They think that is going to somehow restrict uh, freedom. 
But if you're actually a wage earner in the middle of the country, and uh, you know, you've, your family has been connected with industry for a very long time, and now that is being uh, you know, sort of liquidated, the jobs are certainly going away. Uh, we're still creating a great many uh, products to sell, but a lot of it is automated, and a lot of it uh, that is not automated has been taken over uh, by foreign entities. Um, you can see that if you are a worker who has been uh, sort of marginalized by this economic development, an economic development that is not entirely a free market development, in fact, that you would feel kind of resentful towards uh, the political apparatus in the United States, and you'd want to support almost any kind of populist movement that's going to um, raise a ruckus about it, however effective or ineffective it might be. At least it's going to be speaking to your interests and your concerns. And that's maybe one lesson that libertarians should take to heart right now. Um, regardless of what libertarians think about trade policy or tariffs or so forth, uh, they actually need to make a case to middle America that is in the terms that matter to middle Americans, in terms of uh, you know, being able to provide for their families, in terms of dignity, uh, as well as uh, having this firm employment, but a sense that their employment is something that is valued and, and, and uh, uh, you know, is something that has a social function as well as having um, you know, a paycheck attached to it. And that's one reason why I'm very skeptical of the proposals you see from some national conservatives or reformicons of you know, many years ago, uh, which is that they would prefer to see things like wage subsidies, for example. Uh, I don't think that does anything to uh, really help uh, people who actually want to have economic independence, um, but they want economic independence from China as well as economic independence from Washington. The tendency of, of libertarians to focus on economics uh, and to let the questions of liberty, you know, however they are understood, uh, go begged is, I think, uh, detrimental. Uh, economics is a function of liberty rather than the other way around. Um, that's not to say that, you know, obviously property rights, are, they are fundamental, uh, but it doesn't do any good to talk about the empirics of economics if you are missing out on the fundamentally moral claims uh, for liberty. And here again, I think there is a lot to be learned and recovered from uh, the tradition of fusionism that Ian alluded to. And in general, uh, there is a way in which you can meet uh, people who have concerns about how their liberties are in practice uh, being constrained and try to show them libertarian solutions to the difficulties they are facing. Um, now that maybe may require some creative thinking on the part of libertarians. It's not, necess it's not gonna require, I think, uh, going in favor of uh, government solutions. That's something libertarians will have to reject, but it will require uh, talking about culture perhaps in ways that are unaccustomed. If we think about you know, social media, for example, where many people have uh, concerns about their freedom, for example, not only to discuss uh, you know, what's going on in terms of crime and other sensitive issues like that, but also talking about things like COVID-19. Uh, if you have you know, sort of critical thoughts on the policies that have been enacted uh, in all of our countries, uh, many Americans uh, and people elsewhere too, feel as if uh, the social networks are going to squelch uh, their dissent. Now the social networks are private, so they do have the right to do these kinds of things. They have the right to silence whomever they please. Uh, but that doesn't mean that their uh, use of that right is necessarily sound or something that libertarians should support. And this is a difficult question, I think, for libertarians because it does come down to a matter of a, a cultural choice on one side or the other. Um, you know, and it's parallel to something we could have seen years ago with questions like, um, should uh, sales of uh, music with explicit lyrics be labeled? Uh, those, that was a question I think libertarians had to deal with in the 1980s here in the United States. Uh, it goes to the heart of questions like whether bookstores should carry uh, Salman Rushdie's novels, if it's going to create you know, a sort of dangerous environment because radicals might try to uh, carry out a fatwa against Rushdie or against people who sell his books. This too was something that uh, 30 or 40 years ago, libertarians had to deal with. And it wasn't um, a matter of pure uh, government policy. It was a matter of what kinds of policies should bookstores follow? What kinds of policies should record, record labels follow? And if you want to have an environment of freedom, you have to do things that uh, preserve a culture of freedom, a culture of free expression, of vigorous argument, and of tolerance for people with opinions that you may find erroneous. And this is something that uh, the American left increasingly uh, is not in favor of. They want to see uh, a kind of uh, very puritanical view of what can be said and what can be expressed. Uh, and corporate America increasingly partly because it's terrified, partly because they're afraid of protests and they're afraid of revolts by their own junior staffers. Corporate America is truckling to the left and is enforcing basically a left-wing uh, moral orthodoxy, almost a religious orthodoxy, upon the people who use the services of these very large um, uh, tech uh, products, whether it's Facebook or you know, Google's advertising system or anything else. 
it's a difficult question for libertarians because libertarians can very easily uh, tackle questions involving straight coercion, involving uh, you know, state policy. But when it comes to the kind of soft coercion or the kinds of uh, psychological manipulation uh, that takes place uh, you know, oftentimes uh, behind the scenes within HR departments in, in companies or uh, publicly or over the social networks as policies are imposed on people, uh, these are questions which don't have that clear-cut libertarian, uh, you know, sort of a non-aggression axiom uh, criterion that can apply to them. Instead, they are questions of judgment. They're questions of, you know, are these companies which have a right to do the things they're doing uh, using their rights uh, in a way that is wise and that is conducive to a broad cultural freedom? And national conservatives have said they are not. And I think uh, libertarians, if they were to examine their consciences, would also find that they actually agree with uh, national conservatives on many of those uh, critical points. So it seems to me that one thing national conservatives have done uh, that libertarians can find great value in is identifying a lot of the discontents that many American voters uh, feel. And libertarians may have different solutions to those discontents. They may have different strategies for approaching them, uh, but they needed that warning sign. They needed that siren going off, that alarm, uh, in order to be aware of just how uh, oppressed many Americans feel and just how uh, jeopardized uh, they feel and how uh, betrayed they feel by a political elite that they think is far more favorably disposed towards uh, you know, com communist apparatchiks in China than it is to America's own workers. And finally, just to conclude, I will say that there is this tendency among some libertarians and certainly among progressives to uh, take a social Darwinist view of a great many Americans and to say that um, you know, the old American middle class is um, it's simply too wealthy, it has too many privileges, uh, you know, it has uh, too many uh, pension funds, it should all be liquidated, it's just not very efficient, and that uh, you know, a good Darwinian survival of the fittest would mean that these deplorables are basically economically reduced, they are uh, you know, sort of going to be uh, at a lower level, and that it really there should be a preference for uh, hardworking people from the outside world, whether that means in trade for people in other countries uh, such as China, or whether in terms of immigration it means we should treat uh, you know, the citizenry we already have as kind of dead weight and import uh, a new harder worker citizenry. That's certainly the attitude that seems to come through uh, from a great many libertarians when they talk about economics. And you can understand why uh, Americans uh, in the, the heartland hear these kinds of uh, claims and they reject them and they say that, well, this is obviously going to be disastrous uh, for me and for my family if I were to let uh, these uh, you know, sort of libertarian think tank types uh, dictate the trade policies, dictate the immigration policies under which we have to live. Um, so there's a need for libertarians to reconnect with these concerns and to um, not talk about uh, Americans as being deplorables, American citizens as having sort of retrograde uh, views, American citizens and, uh, you know, for that matter, allies all around the world as uh, being a Western and therefore guilty of the most, um, you know, inexpiable sins of racism and colonialism and imperialism. Uh, this kind of anti-Western attitude is, is rampant on the left, dominant upon the left, uh, and libertarians, I think, feel a little bewildered. They don't know whether they want to reject it or whether they want to try to appeal to the left themselves. Um, so I think I will wrap up there and just say that there is uh, a great deal of common ground among libertarians and national conservatives to be rediscovered, recultivated, and, uh, uh, and turned into a very prosperous relationship. Uh, but it will depend on getting back to some of these core fundamental questions First of all, whether libertarians are comfortable at all within a nation state framework where there are in fact distinctions between citizens and non-citizens, where there is in fact a border that separates one country from another, and when there are interests uh, that are um, competitive in security terms, if not simply in economic terms, uh, between different states and different kinds of regimes, or whether libertarians really feel that you know, the time has come to completely dissolve the nation state and simply to uh, sort of free capital and free individuals to be as mobile as possible even if that winds up being um, a picture in which uh, the quite powerful and aggressive Communist Party of China uh, winds up being able to steamroll over uh, a great many people in the West. That's absolutely spot on, Dan. That was, I think Tim Andrews is very, very correct when he says that this particular breakout, this particular session will go viral. Uh, two speakers in, one more to go. We welcome Sam Gregg to Freedom 8, and thank you very much, Dan. Sam, have we got you there? I'm here. Sam is here. <laughs> welcome. Welcome. 
Welcome. It's good to be talking to the Friedman Conference. Great to be talking to my fellow Australians. Like Ian, I am a migrant to the United States. I'm very happy to be participating in this, um, I suspect, international, but still very much a highly Australian uh, meeting. So the question we're posed with, and I'm going to try and avoid repeating anything that um, Dan or Ian has said, is, of course, this issue of how do we engage national conservatism? And I guess I come at this from the standpoint of someone who calls himself a Burkean Whig rather than a, a libertarian. And maybe towards the end, the, some of that distinction will become uh, clearer. So I think we need to ask ourselves, first of all, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to ask why I think there has been this emergence of this national conservatism. And then I'm going to just outline some ways in which I think it's possible for economic liberals, free marketers, classical liberals, uh, libertarians can engage national conservative concerns rather than simply dismissing them as being irrelevant and somehow will be dissolved over time as the market continues its march throughout history. So the first, first reason I think we've seen the emergence of national conservatism, of course, is the phenomena of what I'm going to call globalism. Now, I don't mean by that economic globalization, although that's obviously the two things are related. But by globalism, I mean the emergence and the turn on the part of many political elites, particularly in uh, Western Europe and some parts of North America, towards transnational institutions and supranational institutions. The European Union is the, the example of this, obviously, which comes to most people's minds immediately. And one of the reasons I think we see the emergence of national conservative movements is a pushback against these types of institutions, these supranational institutions, which are very detached from the concerns of real live people uh, who quickly develop agendas and interests of their own. I think the European Commission is a very good example of this and which are seen as unaccountable, highly undemocratic and uh, whether it's true or not, focus primarily upon their own interests and not particularly interested in the views of anyone who might have some disagreements in the way that they want, they want politics and not just on a domestic level, but on a supranational, international level to go. So I think national conservatism reflects pushback against many of these institutions, uh, which I think some libertarians to a certain extent have, in, have engaged. The second, of course, is immigration. Like Ian, I'm a migrant, so I can, I can speak with some credibility on this subject, I think. But what I think if you, if you, when it comes to immigration and the national conservatism movement, the unwillingness of governments to enforce sovereign borders has alienated a lot of people from the idea of relatively free migration between countries which of course libertarians tend to hold to. I think if you want to understand Brexit, I think the biggest single issue which pushed the Brexit side over the line was the decision of Angela Merkel to admit 1.5 migrants from the, from the Middle East straight into the country. And many people in Britain said, we've lost control of our national borders. It's not a question of racism. It's not a question of being against migrants or anything like that. It's much more a question of, we are no longer in control of our destiny. We're having these things pushed upon us. No one asked us if we want large numbers of migrants coming into the European Union, which means they come into Britain. So I think that's another re reason why we see the resurgence of national conservatism. And I want to stress, it's not racism. It's not racism. It's a concern about control of national borders. Third reason which uh, Dan has alluded to is of course the rise of China. Back in 2000 when uh, China was admitted to the WTO, the working assumption I think of most Western governments was that China's gradual integration into global markets would result in the country moving more in the direction of greater civil liberties, greater political liberties, greater religious liberties. Well, none of that has happened. None of that has happened. 
We've discovered that China has decided to go its own way on many of these questions. Uh, we've even seen the, the uh, turn away from <clears throat> more strictly market policies towards outright mercantilist policies on the part of the Chinese regime. <clears throat> and it's going in exactly the opposite direction when it comes to many of these foundational freedoms. So the reaction, which I think is quite understandable on the part of many people, is that clearly markets are not enough if we're interested in seeing some of these societies which are ruled by highly authoritarian governments, which don't respect liberty, markets are clearly not enough. And in some respects, some people would argue that the access to global markets has enabled countries like China, who is not a friend of the West, countries like China to act in a highly aggressive way using literally Western freedoms against us. So, and what's interesting about this is that economic liberals have not said very much about this type of question. And that, that, that will bring me to an issue of, of the national security stuff. Another issue which I think is driving the, um, the national conservative movement, not just in America, but elsewhere, is the shift of very large or at least economically powerful groups who have benefited very much from markets and economic globalization and innovation, the drift of many of these groups to the embrace of deeply illiberal policies. A very good example, of course, is the tech sector in much of the United States. Uh, if you want to see a definition of woke, take a very good look at the tech sector in the United States. We see the emergence across, across the United States and many Western countries of what I like to call woke capitalism, whereby more and more of the corporate world is embracing uh, agendas that are seen by many national conservatives as repressive, in, inherently anti-traditional, and even in some respects, removing the control of very large businesses away from control by shareholders because now executives and managing directors can say things like, well, we'd like to pursue more profit, but guess what? We have to satisfy the following five extra bottom lines, which we think are very important. And that's a way of separating uh, the control of the management of these organizations from the people who actually own them in many respects. And I think that in many respects, what's interesting about this is that I have noticed that libertarians seem to be reluctant to criticize this trend towards wokeness in corporate America and in the corporate world in general. And it's not a question very much, I think, of whether they actually agree with some of the, the, the woke ideas or whatever they happen to be. It's much more the sense that these organizations are acting in a highly repressive way. They're using corporate power to shut down and manipulate and humiliate and stigma, stig, stigmatize any number of positions as being simply unacceptable. So I think in many respects, the failure of a good number of libertarians to challenge this trend of woke capitalism, not just in terms of the fact that it's, it, it's alienating lots of conservatives, but also it's distorting the purpose of private enterprise and business in itself. The failure, I think, of many libertarians to engage that particular question, I think has resulted in alienating large numbers of conservatives from people that they used to spend a lot of time with and arguing many of the same causes. So what do we do about this? Well, I think in the, I've, I've got basically four things, I think that uh, those of us who believe in markets and economic liberty can say and do about. The first, I think, is to point out the rise of economic nationalism on the left. Ian alluded to this a little bit. But what I find interesting is that if you look at some of the economic policies of, pursued by, for example, Senator Elizabeth Warren, they're not actually that different from some of the economic ideas we're seeing being articulated by some of the national conservatives. So I think that it would be useful for classical liberals, market liberals, to point out that the left are embracing many of the same economic policies. It's not as obvious, I think, because the focus is now upon uh, the right when it comes to these issues, but the left is embracing many of these issues, uh, ranging from things like um, the Green New Deal, which was alluded to before by, by Ian, but also things like 
forcing companies to have X number of quote unquote worker representatives, which we all know is code for trade union officials, right, on their boards. Uh, so that's one area. And, and not it's not just free market people who should be concerned about that. A lot of conservatives would be very disturbed by the, the fact that the left are moving in that direction. Uh, secondly, I think it would be useful for classical liberals to express more concern and reservations about some of these supranational and international institutions that I mentioned before. Now, there are plenty of classical liberals who have long expressed reservations about some of these, these, these organizations, but I don't think it's enough. And I do think that this is something that uh, if you're trying to reach out to national conservatives, this is an obvious point because in the end, these supranational institutions I don't think are particularly committed to markets. They're much more committed to ideas of the managerial state. Thirdly, I think it's also true that if you look at the long history of classical liberal thought, which is not monolithic, in which there are numerous schools of thought, there is a long tradition of thinking about questions of association and community. Uh, a good example of this, the most obvious example of this, is someone like Alexis de Tocqueville, who spent a lot more time talking about these types of questions and the relationship between uh, liberty on the one hand and strong forms of civil association, which in the case of the United States that he looked at was primarily through religious organizations. There's a long tradition of thinking about these types of things, which I would be good for classical liberals and market liberals to go back and have a closer look at and realize that there are ways of talking to national conservatives about things they care about from within the very tradition of classical liberal thought in itself. Uh, I think the last thing I will say is this. It's very important for classical liberals, those of us who believe in markets, to get out of ideological ghettos and silos. In my experience, a lot of classical liberals spend most of their time talking to each other. And it's very important, I think, that they actually go and engage with those people with whom, in many cases, they were in strong alliances until relatively recently and have honest discussion about some of these issues so that they can hear what national conservatives are saying about these issues, so that they can rethink the way that they approach questions like national security, which Dan alluded to, and which I think is very important when it comes to many of these, these discussions. Getting out of those type of ideological silos, I think is extremely important if you're interested in persuading people. If you're interested in showing people how markets and strong institutions of private property and rule of law can resonate in many ways with some of the things that conservatives, whether they're national conservatives or social conservatives, care and think about. I certainly find that when I approach these issues, I always start the discussion by saying something like, I'm a Burkean Whig, because the reference to Burke makes it very clear that there's a whole range of different questions that I'm essentially on the same page as, as uh, conservatives. But then I also point out that Burke had a pretty strong commitment to free markets as well. So I think that type of engagement, one that's respectful, that doesn't dismiss people who have concerns about what they see going on. I think Dan's point is very right here. Don't dismiss them as being these troglodytes from the past who are hanging on to a world that no longer exists. They have concerns. So many of these concerns are legitimate. And if classical liberals are interested, and that's assuming they're interested in having some sort of discussion, let alone forming alliances, with conservatives against a left that is going more and more in a Jacobin direction, I think it behooves classical liberals to engage in these discussions because if they don't, uh, the woke apocalypse, I think one of my fellow conferees said, will be very soon upon us. Thank you. Mm -hmm.